Can I ask one more question? Sure. Mm-hmm. So if a mom that's listening to this is struggling with getting resources for her child, regardless of what type of school, income level, district, whatever. Who I need to be. Welcome back to Mom Nation from the Heart. And now a word from our sponsor. Hi, it's Marilyn and Bruce of Montage Duo. We are a versatile musical act that performs music from the 1940s to today. We cover a wide range of musical genres and styles, including classic rock, pop, country, funk, blues, and even a little jazz. So, if you're looking for professional quality entertainment in the greater Phoenix area, either for an intimate acoustic setting, or a rock and full band sound, Montage Duo will please you and your guests, engaging them to join in the fun by providing an interactive entertainment experience. For more information, visit our Facebook page at Montage Duo. Hey, Mom Nation, we are back with another episode of From the Heart, where we share inspirational stories, useful information, and discuss a variety of women and mom-related topics. I'm Katie, the founder of Mom Nation, and I'd like to welcome our two co-hosts, Sherry and Jenny. Welcome back. Hello. Hello. How are you guys doing? Hi. Fantastic. I don't know um, if school is back for everyone else, but for me and Katie, our kids are back in school, so it's a good day. Lucky ladies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love my child and all let's, let's just, you know, get that out there, but we all need our me time, right? They, they need their me time where they can socialize with friends, get some learning on, do that kind of thing, get some playing done. I need my me time too. So yeah, it works for me. Natalia is shaking her head. Yes. Over there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I agree. Awesome. Well, Natalia, I guess it's a really great time to introduce you then. I'm really excited to talk with you today. Um, Love working with you in Mom Nation. For those of you who don't know Natalia Harvey, she is the state leader on the admin team for our Illinois group. So she is up in Illinois. How is the weather up there? It must be beautiful. It is very beautiful. It's a good day today. So it's not super humid. So Nice, nice and sunny. What's the temperature? Come on, tease us a little bit. I don't know. Um, probably in the eighties, if I had to guess. I just popped in outside for just a minute, but that's awesome. In the 80s. Not bad at all. In Phoenix, as you know, Phoenix summers—they're a little bit hot, um, <laughs> just a little. And uh, but we've been experiencing some calmer weather. Like, what do you think, Jenny? Like, it's been nice, right? It's been in the low hundreds instead of you know, 120. Yeah. (laughs) This is an abnormal summer for us. Like, I mean, we got down into, I think the nineties or something like that, like a week or two ago. And of course I was in Colorado on vacation, so I missed it all, (laughs) but I did look at my app and was like, what, this has got to be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's not been a typical summer. It has not. Natalia made a face when, when you guys said low hundreds, I saw (laughs) Natalia's face. I'm from Chicago. So like, I know when you hear that, you're like, what? But yeah. it's totally different because Chicago's humid. Yes. And 90s. And that's gross. I would 100% rather 115 dry heat. Yeah, like, yeah. for so. sure. It's hard to breathe. Like when you come off, when you, um, when I go somewhere um, and then I come back to Chicago and I, and I exit the airport, it's like, <gasps> yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. To breathe. So. yeah. Yeah. Rick's havoc on my hair too. My hair is just like <laughs> Diana Ross. It gets nuts. I was in New England. That's how it was. And then I came back home and my hair's like, sweet, I'm home now. We're good. <laughs> But anyway, we're not talking about hair. We are not talking about weather today. Natalia is a speech therapist and we have some great questions for her. And I'm super excited to hear a little bit more in detail about what you deal with on a daily basis. Um, You know, what parents are having to deal with when they have children that need your services, that kind of thing. So can you just tell us a little bit about you, kind of give us an idea of your background so that we kind of know where you come from, what you do on a daily basis? Yeah, of course. And I just, just a little caveat, I locked my dog away and he found 
the other entrance. So he's sitting behind me. So I hopefully he's, he behaves and doesn't start barking during this. Um, so I apologize in, in advance if he does. No worries. So I, yeah. So I, um, yeah, I'm a speech and language pathologist. I, um, have been doing this since 2013. Um, and I work at elementary, I work in elementary schools. So I work, I'm from the, I'm from Chicago and I work in the Chicagoland area. And I've worked in a few different districts now. Um, so that was a good, you know, thing to see, um, kind of experiencing the different districts and how they operate. But I typically work from anywhere from K to about eighth grade. Um, and I work in um, the school setting. So the public school setting. And I provide speech therapy services for kiddos that need it. That's awesome. Well, thank you for all that you do. I'm sure you do a lot and you make a huge impact on the lives of those children. So thank you. Um, let's, let's dive into it a little bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, for somebody like me who um, hasn't dealt with this situation uh, personally, what's the typical timeline for speech development? Like, what are we looking at as a typical? And then what kind of things should we look out for that maybe indicate our child needs some additional support? Yeah. So when you're looking at um, zero to three years old, that's um, early intervention. Um, and so you're looking at, so anything from up to about 12 months old, you're going to see a baby communicate in their own way. And that is through babbling or cooing, making noises. Um, and that's kind of the way that they communicate. Um, also by, so about 12 to 15 months, um, your baby should be pointing to things, um, making some sort of intentional communication. So um, trying their best to make it known what they want. So by pointing or by saying a word, uh, you know, it, the, the development is so uh, varies a lot. Um, I have two kids. I have an almost three-year-old and I have a almost 15 month old and the development just between those two is huge, 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 huge difference. So, um, I, before I kind of dive, dive into what are the cutoffs and when you should be worried, um, I would encourage every parent to be, um, informed. And so I would do your research as much as you possibly can. And whether that research is through Google studies, Facebook groups, mom groups, um, doctors, different specialists, just get informed because if there is an inkling, um, that, you know, something may be off or your child may be delayed. Um, it, it's, it's, I feel like you make the best decisions and the best choices, the more informed you are and the less informed, I feel like it's easier to get really scared or get really panicky or go in the opposite direction and then just be in denial. So, um, and you know, they say that early intervention is, is it's the best, it's best in to intervene earlier than it is to wait, wait and see. Um, so it's kind of my, my, what I wanted to plug there. Um, so yeah, so 12 to 15 months, you should see, uh, the first few words emerging, um, by 15 months, if they don't have a word, um, maybe talk to your doctor. It's, you know, some kids go wait until um, say their first word after 15 months, but typically by 15 months, we should see your first word. Um, 18 months, your vocabulary is increasing. Um, they should have joint attention. So they should be making eye contact with you. Um, you know, enjoy sharing experiences with you. They should be, uh, able to kind of follow one step commands. So like sit down or come here, simple things like that. And then by two years old, we're looking at, um, at least a hundred words and then combining them. So they're starting to combine them into two to three word sentences. Do you, do you find that, so that, I mean, every kid, like you just said, every kid is different, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. there may be, you know, some may do it a little bit sooner, maybe yes. some a little bit later. Do you find that when I was a new mom, I was freaked out about absolutely everything. And I made a huge big deal out of absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. So do you find that parents are kind of doing that or what is your experience? And then what is your advice for a mom like me that freaked out about everything? Yeah. So, um, 
I don't typically work with zero to three. Um, you have to have extra certifications to cut. You have to keep up your certifications to work with um, early intervention. And I work um, preschool to kind of um, eighth grade. And so I don't work with parents of newborns often. Um, they'll ask for advice and such, but I don't work with them. Um, so I don't know that I can comment on um, whether parents freak out or not. Usually I see them when once they're in preschool. And so parents are either, for the most part, are either like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, panicking, but they've, they've kind of gone through a few years of it already. Um, or are just not, it's not on their radar yet. And they're kind of still, no, 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 nothing's fine. I don't, you know, or nothing's wrong. So my advice, again, my best advice would be to um, just really do your own research because um, that's, that way you can feel more comfortable um, in, in, in what you're seeing with your child. Because at the end of the day, you, you know your child the best. Um, and so you kind of have a, a gut feel, like a gut feeling is there for a reason. Um, just the reason why I say to research is because sometimes if, if you don't and maybe somebody else is bringing it up, like a, like a, a different experienced mom or your own parents or, or a doctor that's kind of seeing something um, and you don't have knowledge about it, I think it is easy for some parents just to put it off and say, no, 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 no. Um, you know, don't want to hear it, don't want to see it. So, um, and then again, early intervention is the best um, it's kind of the best method to get them going because the ch children are developing so at such a rapid rate uh, when they're younger that they're, you know, they're not only just trying to learn language, they're trying to walk, they're trying to, to, to um, crawl, they're experiencing everything. All of these senses and all of these different develop developmental milestones are being met that um, you don't want them to fall behind. But then you also don't want to panic or freak yourself out either. So just be an informed um, parent, I would say. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that, I feel like in families, right? When it's your kid, you, you know what words they're saying, obviously more so yes. than somebody outside of the family. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that helps us with the denial phase? Like, well, we know what they're saying just because you can't figure it out. That's your problem. Like do parents yeah. do yeah. So here's the thing. A word that is not maybe correctly said when kids are younger still counts as a word. They're just, they have, they're having articulation issues. So they're having sound issues. Um, so that still counts as a word. So as far as language, it would, it would go towards kind of like the language count, like how many words they have. It's just that it, once they get older and it becomes very difficult for other people to understand them. Um, that's when you kind of get into an articulation or phonological disorder where they're just not like, for example, the most common one that you guys probably heard with your own kids is like wabbit for rabbit. So that's pretty typical, right? Um, until about age eight, depending on um, your district and what guidelines you follow. But, um, you know, we would be able to understand when a kid is saying rabbit instead of rabbit. But if your child, as they are getting older, are just saying, and we're making a lot, a lot of mistakes and it's difficult for them to communicate to others, like um, strangers would not be able to understand them if they're asking for help, that's when it becomes an issue. So yes, it can play into, um, it can play into that for sure. I'm assuming, and I don't know anything about this, so I'm leaning on you, obviously. I'm assuming that there are some physical reasons for uh, mispronunciation too, or is that all developmental? Yes, there can be. So I guess I should um, backtrack a little bit. So speech and language pathologists generally deal with um, a different, different sets of um, disorders or that are speech and language, speech and language wise. So we look um, and we treat um, we work with people who stutter, people, who, or pe when, when I say people, I mean children or adults, um, those who um, have a difficult time making sounds correctly, so articulation, um, being able to understand, um, so your receptive language, kind of what your, how, how your brain is processing information that's coming into it, uh, your expressive language, so how it is that you're speaking as far as your vocabulary, your grammar, just any type of output link like output language um, and swallowing 
and anything medical as far as um, post um, stroke and all of that. So, and I'm probably missing one or two things so now that I'm put on the spot, but those are kind of the different areas that we work generally with for the most part. Um, and there can be different things that impact the way that you make sounds. So you can have a tongue tie, you can have a lip tie. Um, yeah, and that can impact a lot of parents see that impacting their, if they're trying to nurse, the baby has a hard time nursing, um, things like that. Yeah, and then cleft lip and palate, those, um, those type of things can in fact, uh, um, sorry, can impact the way that you make sounds as well. And oh, I'm curious, just, mm -hmm. sorry. I'm curious if the kids that you work with, do they typically have other um, disorders maybe that are causing their speech delay or, or issues that they're having? And I say that because I have a hearing impaired child. Mm -hmm. So I know that, you know, I knew from the moment she was born that, you know, speech would be something we would need to work with her on. And so I imagine there's other, you know, learning disabilities or so many out there. For sure. and, and so I'm curious if that's typical or is that possible to have a speech delay or, um, you know, that's not learning, you know, that's not tied else. to another disorder. Yeah, for sure. There are comorbidities for sure. So you can have either something that's exclusive, um, or a comorbidity. So we see a lot of children, I would say most children with, um, an autism disorder, um, are seeing a speech therapist because they have so, some sort of speech and language delay or disorder. Um, kids who have a difficult time hearing, obviously if you have a hard time hearing, you have a hard time imitating and pronouncing things correctly as well. Um, social children that deal, um, that deal with kind of social disorders, um, that also pragmatic language that also falls into speech and language. Um, any type of um, ear infections are huge as well too. So kids with a lot of ear infections, can have, can present with delayed speech and language um, because they can't hear or they have difficulty hearing, not that they can't hear, but they have difficulty hearing. Um, and so those kind of um, milestones are developed or yeah, those milestones are not being met um, when they should be, but something like their gross motor, how they're walking, how they're crawling, those are all being met. So it can, it can definitely vary. This question's for Jenny. Sorry, Natalia, but you no, pipe in okay. too. If you have, uh, you know, some comments to make, can you share with us a little bit about your experience? Did you go through speech stuff with your daughter? Can you just kind of fill us in on those details a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Ava was born um, hearing impaired and we found that out at the hospital the day she was born. They take your baby away and they do that little hearing test and she failed it. And, you know, me being in denial, I'm like, Oh, it was probably just, you know, whatever. I'm not worried about it. So I, I didn't even accept it yet. And then um, they actually sent a home audio, uh, like an audiologist or just like a test to be done at the house to confirm the results and confirmed again that she was hearing impaired. So it started at birth, you know, testing um, and got her in hearing aids from early on. And then, um, well, they, so they would send like an early interventionist. They kind of right away connected me with someone. And at the time I didn't, you know, she was young and I didn't really see the need to send her in to receive services yet. And so right about two, um, we started having a speech pathologist come to the house twice a week and they um, did that up until she was four. And then they helped us transition her into preschool where they helped us get an IEP. They helped you. She actually had to qualify to be into like a special class that dealt with speech or hearing impaired kids. Um, ever, all of the kids in there had some sort of a speech or hearing um, disability. So um, yeah, so since birth, we've, we've been dealing with that. And then now, then once she got into actual elementary school, which she had her IEP and she would see the speech pathologist there through school, um, actually up until last year um, with COVID, Ava was not about to do that, you know, through Zoom at home. She's way too shy and was not having any part of that. Um, and then when they did her last, um, I can't remember what the AZ merit testing or whatever those testing tests that they do, she's just consistently scoring so high that they came back and said, you know, we're looking at her IEP and she's excelling on every single thing. Like there's nothing left to come back and qualify her for to continue the IEP. And I, I tried to fight back, but they were like, she has to be 
there has to be something to qualify her. And to me, like, well, she's hearing impaired. Doesn't that qualify her? But where is she failing? Like, what is, what is, she wasn't, wasn't behind in any, in any of her, um, you know, classes, she was actually ahead in everything. So, um, uh, this will be her first, first year without any speech classes, so we will see how it goes. But they did put her on a 504 plan, which still gives her, you know, I, I have on there, she has to sit at the front of the room. Um, if there's, you know, just certain, if there's going to be a pep assembly, you know, if it's too loud, I want you to be able to let her leave the room because the, the loudness scares her, you know. So there's certain things that we're still working on, but she is not receiving any speech therapy this year for the first time. Wow. So it's been quite an experience with her. All right. My phone was ringing. So you cut out. <laughs> oh, I just said, it's been quite an experience with her. I mean, you've, you've had to go through some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's been hard. Yeah. Yeah. COVID. Yeah. Exactly. COVID, and you told us all about like, you know, the computers and the masks and that was a huge struggle for her. And that's, it was hard for anybody with, you know, an IEP or struggling with something else, you know? And that's exactly. Actually and that was, yeah, go ahead. I will I will actually have a question for you regarding the mask, but what I was going to say is the masks have been very hard for her because she, um, not only does it muffle the sound, but it blocks the lips. So there's no reading right. lips. There's no, you know, so it's been really, really difficult for her. So I'm curious how that has affected you and the kids that you're working with and, you know, how you do your job, because I'm sure you were probably at home. You probably had to do Zoom meetings. You probably had, you know, face masks that you're dealing with. So that's that's had to have been a challenge for you. For sure. For sure. It definitely was a challenge. Um, the district did give us masks that are clear in the center um, to kind of help. Um, but that, you know, I mean, it was a struggle for sure. So I had to increase my volume. I had to be extra articulate. I had to work with kids on um, kind of differentiating the sounds that to us may not seem like a big deal, but children with, um, you know, any type of hearing impairment or that even have difficulty paying attention, um, they can struggle with. So that for sure was a challenge. And then over, you know, so sometimes I found that therapy over zoom was easier than therapy in person, um, because they can at least see my mouth. So it was definitely, um, a struggle and I had to kind of adjust for every student that I see in their, in their differing needs, but yeah. And the, the IEP that Jenny, you had been talking about, that's um, for anyone, for the, any of the viewers that are not familiar with this, it's an individualized education plan. And it's something that um, a school, a, typically a public school, sometimes private will as well, um, will give to a student who does qualify and it's a legally binding document that outlines set goals for specialists to target. And then, you know, I'm pretty sure it's similar, if not the same in every state as far um, in Illinois, it's once you qualify for something like that, um, you meet at least once a year with the team and the teachers and you kind of review those goals and you determine um, what the next steps are and any accommodations that are necessary for that student to have, such as, um, you know, like a vocabulary word bank or um, extended time on things or things um, like directions or parts of assessments that are read out loud to students. So any of those accommodations that would be, that would, that help make, that child um, kind of bring them up to the general education level, those are all included in the IEP. Awesome. And I know that you don't work with, um, you know, newborns and super, mm -hmm. super little kids, but you did go through the timeline, which was really helpful, like what you should expect at what age. Yeah. Um, what are things that parents can do during that time, you know, even if they don't think there's a problem, but just to yeah. help with the general development of speech for their child? Is there anything that yeah. parents could be or should be doing during that time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I have a few things I can recommend. I think I would just like to start off with this. I have um, quite a few friends who I've, you know, kind of coached through and said, oh, you should do this or this be a, or they just see me modeling because I feel like I am a speech therapist all the time, or at least I was my first, my second one. I don't even have time. So um, 
But um, the best kind of way I can put it is, you know, you always want to be talking to your child all the time, right? Reading is really great. Reading is, is incredible for language and vocabulary development. But um, like I have a friend who is always talking to her daughter, always, 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 and super descriptive words and, you know, is always sharing experiences and, um, but her daughter just isn't, isn't picking up the language that she should at the rate that she should. And so one of the suggestions I gave her was to think about if you were learning a new language, like if, you, if somebody came into your house and said, okay, you have to learn this new language, um, how would you learn it the best? And probably the easiest way or one of the easiest ways would be to um, hear a specific word kind of over and over again. So if you, if your target word is yellow, um, you would say, oh, look at this yellow um, squash. Oh, look, your shirt is yellow too. And my shoes are yellow. See, yellow, yellow, yellow. And so I think you would pick up on the word yellow faster than if it was in just constant connected speech. Oh, do you see this yellow squash? This, this pumpkin is orange. Oh, do you see this per chair is purple? Let's walk over there. Do you see? And so that kind, those kind of words get lost. And so that's incredible. That's an incredible way to talk to a child, to be constantly be descriptive and constantly be talking, just talking all the time to them. Um, but if you're finding that they're just kind of not picking up that at the, the pace that they should, a good way is just to kind of pick a few target words and, and focus and repeat them in different contexts, kind of following each other. Um, they kind of pick that up faster. Um, again, books are incredible. So just, re, you know, study after study shows that the more that kids are read to, the, the, the higher they score just in general in school and IQ and every aspect. So, um, and then now I'm drawing a blank, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. No, um, you're all good. um, oh, and then once you're, so not just while you're reading, so you can obviously read the words on the page, but also, um, talk about the story and talk about what's in the pictures and what could happen next. And that's also good for kids, children that are older. When you're reading, um, when you have older kids, like in, in school already, uh, that aren't always picking up and comprehending what's going on in a story, or that's difficult for them. Um, a suggestion I have is to kind of make a movie in your head. So a lot of the times I gauge how much kids are comprehending by having them read something or I'll read something to them. And then I'll ask them, what did you see? Like, what did you actually see in your head? And if they just say, I saw a cat and it was like a whole story about a cat going over a fence and into a yard, whatever. And they just said, I just saw a cat. Then I know that that's probably where those comprehension issues are coming from. So um, I'm, I encourage parents to always think about talking through helping them make that movie in their head. So, okay, what kind of, what color cat did you see in your head? Was it black or was it white? What was the cat doing? Was it walking? Was it prancing? Was it jumping? Where was it going? And so you're, and then at the end of that, then you kind of replay and re-talk about that movie. So it's a good suggestion for kids that are in school. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to ask you yeah. um, about tongue ties. I hear a lot about that in mom groups. It's like a common thing that everyone's bringing up. Um, and do you find that does cause speech issues? And, and I say that also because I have a 14 year old daughter who has actually a really thick tongue tie that I didn't know about because I didn't have Facebook when she was younger <laughs> to tell me that she had a, a tongue tie. But so now when she talks, like it'll just fall out of her mouth. Like she'll be like saying a sentence and it's like, it just like, and we have to like, look at her and be like, wait a minute, reverse, slow down, say it yeah. again, because it, it, she just stumbles on what she's saying. And so I'm curious if that is a thing, is that like a, an, or is that just a Facebook no, <laughs> no. So generally, um, I would say if it doesn't affect you, then there's no need to, to, to address it. Um, if it does, you know, affect nursing, that that's something that that is a personal choice. That is something that you can go ahead and move forward and do. You can have it kind of cut or snipped. Um, as it depends, I guess, how bad the tongue tie is, because if it does restrict movement and it makes, uh, you know, your daughter, if it makes her uh, if it makes it more difficult for her to articulate. And so she has to like slow down and really articulate what she's trying to say. Um, if that, if she can do it, 
without addressing the tongue tie, great. But if it's something that um, she kind of gets tired of doing and wants articulation to come a little bit easier, it can affect it. Yeah, because it can restrict your movement. Like I had um, one of my friends in grad school could not have her, she could not move her tongue past like her teeth. Like it was so restricted. And so it, again, it didn't, it didn't affect her, it didn't affect her speech, but I have seen kids where that can, you know, affect specifically like the S sound where the S comes through your teeth. So it's like, oh no, I'm sorry, not the S sound, the TH sound where it comes through your teeth, like, thank you. And so um, it can, it just depends on how, how bad it is or how much it's restricting the movement. Makes a lot of sense. My kid had a lip tie. Mm, might have a tongue tie too. I don't remember now, um, but it did cause some issues. Sherry. Oh, Sherry. Did you have a question? I did have a question, but go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask you how, cause your daughter is, is in that age range. Age range. Um, have you experienced any of this? How are things going for her? Um, so it's actually part of the question I was going to ask you, do you find that children with older siblings tend to have less issues with speech because they're constantly not only hearing their parents speak, but then their older siblings? So that is a tricky question. Um, I would not say that they have less problems. Um, it just depends on the child. So my first daughter had, um, 80 to hundred words by the time, by the time she was 18 months. So she probably had about 50 to 80 words when she was 15 months. Um, and then 80 plus when she was 18 months and my younger daughter, who's going to be 15 months has like four words. So, and, but she hears them all the time. Um, so it can go one of, one of two ways. Um, you can have the younger one kind of pick up because they have so much modeling from both parents and older siblings that they pick up on things quicker. Um, but you also, or they could go the other way where you'll find a lot of the times, um, uh, they're just reliant on the older one and the older one will say, oh, she wants this, or he wants this. Um, and also you just, I think naturally don't have the time that you have with your first, um, or even like the second to the third, you just don't have the time to dedicate. So there's like, you know, there could be less songs and less, um, less chit chatting and less reading and more like, but they, but they get different skills that the first one didn't have because they didn't have an older sibling. So it can for sure go either way. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I was just wondering because of my personal experience. So my oldest is 15 now. Um, I was a single mom. I was working two jobs. So maybe I probably had less time with her than I do now for my almost three year old. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. But having three, my first needed speech pathology. And I don't know if you know that Katie, like I know you guys know she had an IEP and a comorbidity. So that definitely impacted. Um, but she got out of it fairly quickly. So that, you know, was helpful. It was kinder and first grade. Um, but I was just curious about the additional multiple children. Um, so I like, I like that. And it makes a lot of sense. So both sides, right? Like you might have yes. less time or, um, I did have another question for you though. I want to know, um, I know you're in Chicago and you work with the school districts. I'm assuming because I'm from there not for any other reason that you may work with title one schools, um, in the Chicagoland area. So do you work with schools that are not title one? And then do you have a, as a parent, do you feel that title one schools offer more resources to parents in need like this? Or do you feel that the schools with higher income have more resources? Um, so hard to answer. So I actually, um, I work, uh, in a suburb of Chicago, so I don't work in the Chicago public schools. Um, and I have only worked in one title one school and that was shortly because I covered a maternity leave there. So I don't know that I am, um, equipped to fully answer that question. However, I will say that, you know, by law and um, we are, it, it doesn't really matter what kind of school you work in. If a child, you if you find a need for a child, um, that child should be receiving services, right? But if, um, if there are 
um, like I have friends who are speech paths who work in a predominantly um, in a school that's predominantly Spanish speaking. And so those those children, um, they may show up lower on some speech and language tests, but they're also getting two languages at once, which can also impact and affect um, language development in a different way. So they should be getting language, your test scores may look lower in English, but they should be kind of having higher, kind of higher. Of the health. ESL access. Right, right. Okay. Um, but, it, but they also may have more opportunities for bilingual classrooms or um, whole group sessions, as opposed to a school that doesn't have that. So I think each diff different types of school offer different types of programs and um, yeah, so it would be hard. Yeah, it's kind of hard for me to answer. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Mm -hmm. So if a mom that's listening to this is struggling with getting resources for her child, regardless of what type of school, income level, district, whatever, because in, in when I moved from Chicago to Arizona, I heard about charter schools, never knew what that was in Illinois. We had, you know, that wasn't a thing. Yeah. And when I moved there, I was like, you mean private and I have to pay for this? And they're like, no. So regardless of the school, if a parent is struggling with getting resources, you mentioned a really big key word that legally they have to provide services at any school the same way. So what would a parent do that's needing yeah. these resources that's finding like a wall or something like that? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in a utopian world, every child would, every child that, that has a need would be addressed um, and that need would be addressed. However, um, when you are in, um, when you're dealing with a huge school district um, and maybe a school district that is not receiving the funding that it should be or receiving less funding than it should be, um, there is only, you know, X amount of speech paths or even like OTs or PTs that are assigned to a specific school, right? And so um, those specialists can only physically see so many kids in a day or in a week. And so um, if you find yourself in a situation where you get some sort of answer, such as they're not low enough or, or not, low, not low enough to qualify, or we just, um, we don't have the resources to provide it, or we um, are short a speech path and, and your child just can't be seen. Um, you do have rights. And so you can request that an evaluation be conducted and um, um, an IEP would have to be considered. Now, not necessarily granted because your child does have to qualify under something. Um, and if they, if the team finds that the child is functioning okay in school, then, you know, you're, you're, they, they really have to find something to qualify them under to write those goals and to make them um, kind of more in the general education classroom. You have the right at any of those meetings to bring an advocate. Um, you have the right to see some of the paperwork in advance. Um, and I would formally request an evaluation. If you are feeling that they are, that, you know, um, a school is not kind of doing what, or not meeting um, your child's needs or isn't taking you seriously, or they did a screener, but the child passed the screener. And if you're just not comfortable with that, you can request an evaluation. And um, that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that an evaluation will be completed, but they do have to then legally give you a paperwork saying, um, we considered your request for an evaluation. We will either move forward or we will not move forward for these specific reasons and it's ABC. So, but you, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, that, that was a good question. A lot of information there. Thank you, Natalia. While we're on the school subject, is there anything specifically about IEPs that, or, or even in general, that parents should know about that we didn't discuss today? Um, yeah, so you as a parent are considered part of the team. So the IEP is made up by the team and that team would probably include can include 
special education teacher, general education teacher, occupational therapist, physical therapist, vision itinerant, principal, special ed director. Uh, it can include any and all of those people. Sometimes it's just a speech. Sometimes it's just speech teacher and um, parent. But you as a parent are part of the team. So you have a right um, to decline that IEP. You have a right to make your voice heard that you don't agree with it. That And as a team, you guys have to come to some sort of consensus. And so the, so the specialist working with you should um, be able to explain and hear you out um, on your concerns. However, for the most part, there are, there are a few instances where this does not apply, but for the most part, an IEP is for the student to bring them up to grade level or bring them up to their, essentially their peers. So like Jenny was saying, um, you know, your daughter's kind of like meeting great expectations and she's going above and beyond. And so even though she does have a hearing impairment, that hearing impairment from your story is no longer really impacting her in school. So the IEP is to help children whose needs are impacted in schools. Um, for kiddos that are under three, if you are in a public, um, actually everyone is, so you, um, as, as um, at least for Illinois, I don't know how this works in different states, but public, most public school districts do offer um, preschool screenings. So you can take them to a preschool screening at the few dates that they have them and they'll screen them there and then they can qualify for a pre to be sent to a preschool. Now, this doesn't mean like just a special education preschool. This, they have preschools that are for children at risk. They have, pre, they have preschools where they just, um, they accept, they kind of mix in at-risk kids with, with not at-risk kids who are you know, meeting expectations to kind of mix them up and to give them good models. So there are tons of different programs that each school district can um, provide. So I would look into getting your child screened um, at the preschool screenings, even if you think that they might not qualify, um, it's a good idea to do. Awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, a few minutes ago, you brought up stuttering. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know any kids off the top of my head that have that, you know, that struggle with that, but I do know a few adults, uh, to okay. be honest. So what suggestions do you have um, for parents to help kids that stutter? And can that translate into adulthood too? Yes, for sure. So as far as like research and research is, is um, telling us, it, it stuttering is, is difficult um, in terms of um, typically when a, when a child starts to stutter, that, that is a lifelong struggle. Um, not always, not always. Sometimes they're, they just, they just stop and nobody really knows why. Um, but I would say that more, more than not, um, it's going to follow you into adulthood, um, which is a hard kind of pill to swallow for parents, I, I would imagine. Um, so yes, yeah, so for stuttering, a lot of it is environmental. So as a parent, or even, even as an adult, talking to another adult who stutters, you a lot of the time can affect the way that um, they that they communicate. And so a lot of environmental changes can help assist um, to kind of make it a more calm environment. So one of the, the biggest ones is if you bring down your rate of speech, naturally your communication partner will also bring down their rate of speech. So for example, if I'm talking nice and slow right now, you if, and you were to answer me, you probably wouldn't start talking like this, but you would start matching closer to my rate of speech. So if you, it, um, it's important to kind of bring down your own rate of speech. Um, and so that kind of, they, they kind of meet. And so that person will then also naturally, for the most part, bring down their rate of speech as well. Um, when you're talking with kids um, or even adults as well, you can paraphrase what they say to make sure that they know that you understand what they what they said. So, um, and just in, in a very like conversational way, oh, you want to go to the park after you go to lunch or after we have lunch? Okay, yeah, we can go. We can have lunch first and then we'll go to the park just so that they understand or they know that you understand what they said. 
Um, you know, it's, I think uh, it's very common to break eye contact with people when they stutter. And that is not always the smartest thing to do because you want that then they know that you're kind of uncomfortable and then that makes them uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, maintaining eye contact is really key. Um, being really, especially with children who stutter, being really uh, interested in what they have to say. So, you know, getting down to their level, maintaining eye contact, paraphrasing what they said, um, that's important as well. I love that. That makes a lot of sense. So, this sounds like a really intense job, Natalia. <laughs> like you're, I mean, obviously you work with school, so you've got the summer off. So that must be kind of nice. You get a little bit of a break. Yes, I do. I do get a little bit of a break to like, yeah, Breathe. it's nice. Spend Summers, some time with your own I, kids. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For so sure. you don't have any students over the summer. You I do break. not. I do not. No. Mm -mm. So what do you do over the summer then? I mean, you must be like, Oh my gosh, I have all this work to do and now I have nothing. <laughs> what do I do with my time? <laughs> I am I am a clean wine marketer. Is oh. what I am over the summer. Yes. Um, I am a consultant for Scout and Cellar Clean Crafted Wine. Um, and so that's kind of what I do over the summer, uh, during the during the rest of the year as well. But during the, the summer kind of gives me an opportunity to jump on that. So yeah, right. it's just um yeah, we we uh it's a company that has dedicated um has been dedicated to producing wine that is free of any of the like hundreds of chemicals that you'd find in store-bought wines. And so there's no added sugar. No, it's literally just grapes to glass and there's nothing, they're not sprayed with anything. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what I'm, that's what I do over the summer. Awesome. So it sounds like, you know, even though you're partaking a little bit and partying a little bit, at yeah. least <laughs> in a healthy manner, that's okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. And you said it was Scout and Cellar? Yes. Scout awesome. Cellar. Awesome. Good to remember. Sherry and Jenny, do you have any other questions for Natalia? I don't think so. You covered so much information. This was really I nice. Know. <laughs> it was, I, yeah, we could be on here for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't have any questions. I'm just super excited to try Natalia's wine. I've wanted to for a while, so I'm ready. <laughs> Yeah, you'll have to sample it and let us all know how it goes. <laughs> I will. Awesome. Well, Natalia, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of time with us. Um, that was a lot of information, and I'm sure it's very, very helpful to our listeners, our audience members out there, because I know that there are, I mean, I personally know that there are people that are struggling with this, you know, and moms struggle with so much stuff. It's nice that we can, you know, have a place to come together where we can talk with professionals like yourself in a really laid back sort of conversational manner, because talking with doctors can be intimidating. Yes, it can. Um, and doctors, because they, you know, are so busy, um, they, you know, they're, they're very, very, very busy individuals. So that's kind of why I say again, to make sure that you, um, kind of be your own advocate for your own child. So kind of, you know, it's good to research. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time again so much. And audience members, Mom Nation members out there, if you want to connect with Natalia, the link to her little side gig is in the show notes. So, and there goes her dog. Yeah. He did well. <laughs> I know. You warned us at the beginning. You were like, hey, if this happens, I'm sorry. And look at how well the dog did. Um, so, thank you so much. Oh, he, there he is in the window. He's in the background. Oh, so cute. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> We'll give him a little pet for us. And then audience members, if you're interested in being a guest on the show, please follow us at Mom Nation USA. That's our handle on TikTok, right, Sherry? Everything. And yes. Instagram and Facebook, YouTube, all of the goodies. So definitely give us a follow, send us a quick message, and we'll chat with you and get you um, on the show, which you know how we love that. So um, what we also would love for you to do, please help us out a little bit. We want to get this information out to as many mama's ears as we possibly can. As we just discussed, I mean, the, the four of us feel like it's more comfortable talking about the hard things in a group setting like this, in a laid back setting like this versus, you know, doctors, obviously we need to deal with doctors at one point, but it's nice to connect with other moms. Um, so please help us do that with other moms across the country. Please subscribe to us, download us, rate us on your Facebook favorite podcast platform to help us get out to the masses. All right, guys, it's been awesome. Hope you have a wonderful day.
Bye. 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 Thank you.